battery and assault against Israeli lawmakers on the streets of New York. Oh, and on college campuses in Israel, silencing of speech at university campuses and terrorizing intellectuals in their home. These are all the latest hijinks of Israel's anarchist left. We're going to break it down, talk about what it all means and what Israel has to do going forward. <laughs> To start a discussion today, I want to just take a clip of uh, remarks that Professor Alan Dershowitz gave on Sunday in a debate with uh, member of Knesset Simcha Rotman, the chairman of the Knesset Constitution, Law and Justice Committee, uh, one of the main people who's been shepherding Israel's judicial reform package through the parliamentary process in New York. I think the left, the people today who are generally on, on my side, not necessarily in all matters, but on my side who are opposing reform, have been using extortionate tactics which have hurt Israel terribly. I think they should not, should not be trying to endanger the economy. They should not be trying to undercut the high tech community. They should not be trying to undercut the military. And uh, the reason I stopped, Going to demonstrations of this kind is I think that the people who are opposing uh, a judicial reform have been hurting the state of Israel by using these extortionate techniques. I wish they would stop that, let them have debates. There is nothing about this judicial reform that has anything to do with the economy, that has anything to do with high technology, that has anything to do with Israel's ability to defend itself through the military. Okay, so what is it that uh, Professor Dershowitz is saying here? And you recall uh, Professor Dershowitz was on this show several months ago when the reforms were first uh, put forward. He debated them. He was opposed to them in a debate with Professor Avi Bell. And Simcha Rothman was also subsequently here on this show discussing the reforms and the opposition to them and, and what they mean for Israel and what the opposition is trying to accomplish. So what is what is Alan Dershowitz talking about here? He's saying... You know, you're going against Israel's economy, you, the insurrectionists who are going out and saying that uh, the reforms are forming, placing minimal limits on Israel's judiciary is going to turn Israel into a dictatorship or something like that. And that's going to destroy the economy, the high tech sector and the military. And you're telling the military uh, personnel, active uh, reservists uh, not to go to not to show up for duty. All of these things are harming, causing grave harm to the state of Israel. And if you have a problem with judicial reform, which has no impact whatsoever, not on the economy, not on high technology and not on the military situation in Israel uh, or military readiness or anything else, um, have debates. Talk about it. You know, explain it. Try to see. You try to find a compromise, which, of course, is what what the government has been trying to do all along through mediated talks at uh, the president's residence in Israel. But um, the left won't do it because what we're seeing now is that the residual embers of uh, the liberal left in Israel have just been stomped out. People who just a couple, you know, just a year ago uh, supported just about every single one of the reforms that Justice Minister Yuriv Levine and uh, Simcha Rothman uh, put forward back in uh, late February, um, they now not only do they not only do they uh, oppose any of the judicial reform that they used to support, but they don't support the freedom of speech of the people who today, as Justice Minister, as um, as a Knesset Chairman, uh, uh, as Knesset Committee Chairman uh, Rothman, that they have no right uh, to actually even express their opinions, so let alone you know legislate them uh, lawfully. Um, and and this is something you know that that's pretty amazing. Daniel Friedman, for instance, former Justice Minister, uh, professor at Tel Aviv University, he wrote a book in 2019, a whole book where, among other things, he was explaining that the government was wrong, the, Netan the first Netanyahu government was wrong, when they agreed, uh, to, they bowed to the pressure of the, of the legal tyrants in Israel in the Supreme Court and in the Attorney General's office to subordinate uh, the Attorney General effectively to the Supreme Court by 
uh, allowing the formation of an external committee of experts chaired by a retired uh, Supreme Court justice to vet candidates for the position. Because the minute that you have a, a committee that's responsible for vetting candidates, sort of a commissariat, then it's obvious that anybody who gets through their filter is somebody that they've approved of. And they're not going to approve of anybody who doesn't meet their specific institutional criterion that they think and look and act like Supreme Court justices. So that's that was how the Supreme Court and Israel's legal fraternity uh, seized control over the attorney general's office and of the state prosecution's office. And Daniel Friedman said that this was a completely incorrect move by the government. Back at the time, they just surrendered. Uh, they crumpled under pressure and that that decision has to be revoked and the attorney general has to be resubordinated to the elected leadership of Israel. And, and this whole concept of a, an appointments committee chaired by a judge uh, to oversee the highest government, uh, co highest level government lawyers uh, has to be a abolished. And so, you know, when, but, but that was when, you know, the right sort of people were supposed to be in charge. When the wrong sort of people are in charge, that is, you know, Netanyahu and his, and his cabinet are in charge and the, and the coalition that controls the, the, gov the, the Knesset uh, through democratic elections, which we held on November 1st. Well, now he opposes the whole thing. Now he wants to retain the control over the government through the judiciary and the state legal apparatus because he doesn't want the right wing to actually be able to control anything. He wants them to be disenfranchised, both whether they're voters or if they're policymakers and elected officials. They're not allowed to do anything anymore. That's Daniel Friedman and his colleague at Tel Aviv University, former Tel Aviv Law School Dean uh, Menachem Mautner, who, you know, has come out, he sort of waffled over the years, but he certainly legitimized the view that the legal system has to be reformed many, many times, including in a book that he wrote. So Simcha Rothman, and this brings us back to Simcha Rothman. So Simcha Rothman, he debated Dershowitz in, uh, in, on, in New York on, on Sunday, I think it was, and on Friday night, he and his wife were assaulted by these Israeli anarchists who flew to New York in order to harass him. I talked about this last week, that Shikma Bressler, one of the uh, Ehud Barak financed uh, you know, leaders of the insurrection, she put out this uh, video in uh, English calling for Israelis uh, here in Israel to fly to New York and harass uh, the uh, ministers who were going to the Support Israel parade. Uh, down Fifth Avenue on Sunday and to uh, heckle them at the various conferences and synagogues that they were scheduled to speak at. Um, and so um, that's actually happened. So they flew, a, a bunch of uh, leftist anarchists flew to New York. I don't know who financed their tickets, but I have some ideas. And uh, and for the sole purpose of going in and abusing the lawmakers and the cabinet uh, secretaries or the cabinet ministers who flew to New York to participate in the events of celebrating Israel uh, over the over the long weekend. And so on Friday night, when Simcha and his wife were walking back to their hotel from a Shabbat dinner that they had at the Jewish Agency in New York, they were beset by very violent protesters who were getting in their face with megaphones and and committing battery and, and arguably assault against them. And uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, Silva's bodyguards called the police to get a police escort back to the hotel because they couldn't push the protesters away. And the police uh, were not coming. Um, and they kept be and he had two protesters with megaphones screaming into his ears, you know, fascist, fascist, shame, 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 whatever they were screaming. And, uh, and he grabbed the megaphone of a woman who was using it and blasting into his ear, and he crossed the street. He didn't touch her. He eventually gave it back to her. But the Israeli media, of course, that has ignored completely all of the assaults, all of the batteries against Israeli cabinet ministers, against Simcha Rotman, and other members of Knesset, which I'm going to go through a few of the highlights just from the last year in a second, um, they all got that one clip of him grabbing the megaphone from the protester and uh, said he was being violent towards her, uh, which was which was par for the course because they don't think there's anything wrong with violence against Simcha Rothman or any other elected official in Israel, or really anybody on the right, as I'm going to lay out for you in a second. So 
Um, you know, these these protesters, they filed a complaint against him with NYPD. I personally think that he should be filing a complaint uh, here in Israel for assault and battery uh, and interfering with the work of, uh, of elected officials. These are felonies in Israel. Um, at any rate, um, the NYPD closed the, uh, closed the complaint. But the point is, is that they did this on purpose. And Amichai Shikli, the Minister of Diaspora Affairs, is also at in New York this weekend or over the weekend. I'm taping this on Monday. And he was actually harassed and heckled and demonstrated against in Toronto, where he met with the Jewish federations. And at that meeting, there were dozens of, can of uh, Canadian lawmakers who were celebrating Israel. And if Israel's judicial reform package goes through, then Israel's uh, legal system will be much more similar to the system in Canada than in what we have here, which is just a banana republic controlled entirely by the legal fraternity. Um, and uh, so he had, he was meeting with dozens of Canadian lawmakers at the Toronto Jewish Federation, but nobody talked about that. Um, they uh, The media only uh, covered the protests against him outside. And here, too, most of the protesters were Israelis who flew in uh, to Toronto to heckle him, and they followed him to New York, etc. They went after Nir Barkat, the Minister of the Economy in uh, California, I think he was. So they've all been uh, going through the ropes uh, this whole time. And um, you know, no nothing here is really about judicial reform. It's about destroying Israel's reputation and, and demonizing the Israeli government. Um, and then uh, here in Israel, before Simcha went to New York, he was invited to speak at sort of a debate on the uh, judicial reform at Tel Aviv University last week, and uh, he was assaulted. He was ringed by, he had to be ringed by um, a battery, really, of, of security guards, and he couldn't move anywhere without them because you had these violent, violent um mob members trying to assault him while he was trying to go into the seminar hall where he was supposed to be uh, debating judicial reform, the economic implications of, of judicial reform, which of course there are none, but you wouldn't know that from the Israeli media. In fact, the woman who's been pushing the notion, uh, Karen Marziano, the chief economic commentator at uh, Channel 12, she just got an award uh, for her reporting on this. It was all made up. It was all imaginary. Everything that she said was a lie, and she was just giving her a, a Pulitzer, an Israeli kind of, you know, big, big award for her great reporting, which was completely false. At any rate, so, you know, um, Simcha was assaulted at Tel Aviv University. He gets into the lecture hall, and the leftists uh, inside of the hall blocked him from speaking, wouldn't allow him to speak, and then they vandalized his car. Um, and while he was inside, and then he had to be uh, shuttled also with a ring of security guards all around him into a waiting security vehicle to get him out of campus. His life was, was in danger. Nobody was trying to stop them. And um, the same thing happened the next day uh, to Environmental Protection Minister Edith Silman at University of Haifa. Um, you know, so Enir Barkat has been assaulted three times. Uh, since the uh, in Israel, since it began, Avi Dichter was attacked with a with um, a uh, with a stick. He got hit on the head with a with a big you know rod uh, by uh, somebody when he was walking uh, into an event um, at a kibbutz a few a few weeks ago. And on Friday night, you had these anarchists outside of the prime minister's pri private residence in 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 uh, Caesarea, where he and his wife were spending. Shabbat, and when the uh, when the police tried to disperse the crowd that was rioting for a long, long time on Friday night with megaphones and drums and whistles and all of the rest of it, um, you know, they put uh, one or two of them into the hospital, and then rather than talk about what these people had been doing and the kind of harassment that they're carrying out against the prime minister and his neighbors, uh, everything was saying how it was terrible police brutality. Um, and I'll just give you one lesson. It's not only elected officials on the streets in, in New York, um, a uh, army radio and Channel 14 uh, anchor, Amir Ivgi, was assaulted by protesters who came from Israel uh, when he was also coming out of a synagogue on Friday night. Uh, he's a reporter. I mean, he's not even an opinion uh, journalist. He's not, you know, he's not political. He's just a straight news guy, and he was attacked because he's not 
opposed to uh, the government. And here in Israel, last Thursday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, at 6.30 in the morning, a hundred uh, anarchists, like this mob, uh, descended on the uh, quiet street of uh, Moish Kapel, the uh, president of the Kohelet Forum, uh, again, with their megaphones and their whistles and their drums and their angry banners. Um, and Moish Kapel, what is his crime? Well, he's the head of a think tank that has thought incorrect thoughts and even written them. Uh, the Kohelet Forum wrote a couple of position papers on judicial reform that they uh, gave to uh, Justice Minister uh, Levine and to Simcha Rotman. And uh, in that way, they helped them put together their package of judicial reform. And for that, a Kohelet Forum has been subjected to criminal abuse by leftist protesters since March. Um, back in March, uh, you had a group of uh, uh, elitist, uh, former, very old, former uh, IDF uh, fighters who barricaded Kohelet's offices in Jerusalem with garbage, blocked them from coming out. And then when Mayor Rubin, the CEO, came downstairs to try to talk to them, thinking, you know, Dershowitz style, that we could have a we could have a debate, uh, they started stuffing fake dollar bills into his into his clothes. Um, they came back uh, several weeks later uh, under a ruse. They pretended that they were a flower delivery and these anarchist women came in and started screaming with megaphones at the uh, workers inside of the Kohelet Forum and telling them that they were agents of evil um, and assaulting them inside of the offices. So this has been going on all the time. Um, members of Knesset, members of the uh, coalition and members of uh, the government are harassed 24 seven. And, um, you know, just to get a sense of what's going on, the police are not enforcing the law against them. Nobody's being arrested and police also are being assaulted for, you know, and there are almost no arrests and no indictments. So just to give you a sense of how incredible the lack of enforcement has been against these rioters in 2005, there were uh, large scale national demonstrations against the expulsion of all the Jews from Gaza and northern Samaria. And during the course of the months-long protests leading up to the expulsions of all the Jews and the idea of withdrawal from Gaza uh, in 2005, uh, the Israeli police arrested 6,000 protesters and they indicted 700 of them. Uh, since uh, the left began its riots against the government, and against uh, intellectuals. Um, there have been a total of 96 arrests and no indictments. So there's no law enforcement here. They can block ILO and Highway and Tel Aviv any old time they want. They can assault ministers in the government any old time they want. Um, and and that's what we're facing. Um, and so how would you really, how do I characterize this? I think what we're seeing is basically two things. First is that the left in Israel has just abandoned the democratic game, but completely. Like They're done. They don't care anymore. They're not going to get it anymore. They're not going to win. They don't care. And so, you know, now they just want to beat everybody down. They just want everybody to be silenced. If you don't agree with the way uh, that they do things, you be quiet or we're going to pick at your house. We're going to terrorize you. We're going to beat you physically or we're going to browbeat you into being quiet. You know, um, they like to compare the demonstrations uh, outside of the homes of members of Knesset or Moish Kapel or what have you to demonstrations that right-wing protesters had uh, during the lifespan of the Bennett Lapid government outside the homes of, um, of ostensibly right-wing lawmakers who were in Naftali Bennett's party who had betrayed their voters and joined this very, very far left-wing government uh, and ousted the right from power. And you know, there's there's a big difference. First of all, the people who were were outside of Edith Silman's house and outside of uh, uh, what's his name uh, um, near Orbach's house from from Bennett's party, um, they were they were not so loud. But aside from that, they were going to people who they had voted for and said, you can't betray us, you know, come back home, come back to your, your side. You know, you came from us. We trusted you to represent us. And here you've betrayed everything that you promised. And 
you know, please walk away from this government and represent the people that you were elected to represent. And here what they're saying is, we know that you were elected specifically on this platform, and we don't care. We don't think you have a right. Only we have a right to enact our platform. You do not, and you can enact our platform. If you want to enact your platform, then we're going to terrify and intimidate and beat you. And we're going to practice lawfare against you. And we're going to silence you. So, you know, that's that's one thing. They've just they've checked out of the whole Democratic game. And we see this with the media. So almost, you know, there are two in Hebrew right wing media outlets, Gale Israel Radio and Channel 14 that are not on that are that are supporting the 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 prime minister and the Netanyahu government's plans for judicial reform. And every single other uh, media outlet in Israel is either saying nothing because they're terrified or they're opposed, they're with the left opposing uh, judicial reform. And so not only are, you know, uh, is, is that bad enough, it's also that the media, together with the left, is now trying to shut down Channel 14. You know, they just started a class action suit against them. Every single report that Channel 14 does that in any way is biting in its criticism of the left or the progressive agenda is uh, immediately... Uh, used as as a uh, basis to shut it down, to shut it down, to revoke its broadcast license. That's what they're trying to do. And I think that they're working off of the Newsmax model, but just more violent. Uh, so they want to shut that down, practicing lawfare against the, the right, practicing lawfare through the attorney general against the government. And that's the other thing is that we haven't seen the worst of it yet, right? Because the Supreme Court has already pledged to a to-the-death battle against this government and any reform package. We haven't even gotten to the point where the Supreme Court feels compelled to get involved, but they've already put their cards on the table. They're going to go to full-on insurrection and any effort at any move um, by the government to constrain their power in any way. And, you know, when we look at all of this and what's happening, we have to realize that this isn't about at all judicial reform. You know, we all have friends, um, we all, meaning all of us on the Israeli right, have friends who, particularly abroad, think, you know, this is all just about judicial reform. This was a spontaneous outpouring of concern that, you know, you're going to get these these, uh, these uh, uh, far-right or ultra-Orthodox Jews lording over all of the poor seculars and and taking away uh, their rights. And there was never any truth to these claims. It was all propaganda. Um, but aside from that, there was this uh, very innocent concept that this was really about judicial reform. But as I wrote in JNS last week, you know, recent revelations over the past week have just reinforced what we already knew, which was that this was all very preconceived. Uh, as I wrote last week, Eldad Yaniv, who is a uh, of a leftist turncoat who decided that this is ridiculous, this whole anti-government protest, because the right won fair and square. And so he's now become this um, regular guy on Channel 14 and, and on some dissident uh, uh, shows on, on Channel 1. Um, and he said, um, no, they came to me before the elections, November 1st, all the organizers that are all associated with Ehud Barak, uh, they came to me and asked me to organize this thing, put together the logistics, the financing, uh, the construct of how we're going to do it, the management of this intern in insurrection, that because all of their deep polling showed them that Netanyahu and his coalition were going to win. And so they just, they wanted to overthrow the government that they knew was going to be elected on November 1st. And last week, Gilad Sher, who was Barack's chief of staff when he was prime minister, said in a podcast that um, that he and the director general of the prime minister's bureau when Barack was prime minister, Yossi Kuchik, uh, planned this whole thing in Kuchik's office with former IDF chief of general staff Don Halut and with uh, Orni uh, Petrushka, who's a high-tech billionaire, back in December. So this was weeks and weeks before Yair Yair Levine was even appointed justice minister, much less introduced his plans for judicial reform. This has nothing to do with the judicial reform. It's all about keeping and maintaining power, seizing power back after the people have spoken and rejecting the people's wishes. So this has nothing to do with judicial reform. It's all about power. It's all about denying power to the other guys. And they're using the rhetoric of the progressive left in the United States. They're saying that 
democratic uh, instruments of power are actually power the the instruments of dictatorship the Knesset which is the popularly elected uh people's house in Israel it's the sovereign according to the law is written in Israel and the government is the executive arm of that parliament in our parliamentary system that that is a dictatorial institution and on the other hand the very progressive radical completely politicized and self-appointed a Supreme Court, that's democracy. So our non-democratic institutions are democracy, our democratically elected institutions are dictatorships. And, you know, um, and, and, and so they're turning our vocabulary, our language against us, and they're um, embracing a far-left dogma uh, in order to demonize and delegitimize um, the government, its intellectual supporters, its voters, uh, which are the majority of Israelis, in in furtherance of their power. And they need to disenfranchise the people. They need to terrify our representatives in order to paralyze the government and force it to adopt the policies that it was elected to s cast aside in favor of the policies that the government is enacting. We've we've never experienced something this in your face, violent, hateful, um, incendiary in Israeli history. We've we've never seen people openly state that they reject the legitimacy of the people's choice in Israel, and they think that they have every right, as true Democrats, as the enlightened people of Israel, to set aside the decision of the voters violently if necessary and they're certainly using violence in the streets of israel and now even they exported it to america so you know my view of this and i wrote it and of course the left attacked me for it because they attack me for everything that i say on twitter um or anywhere else but uh you know when you're we're we're being they're lighting the country on fire it's very clear i mean they sometimes they've even done it you know physically like they put you know, candles all along my own freeway one night when they were blocking it. You know, it's sort of like to show that they were setting the country on fire. But anyway, they, they're they setting the country on fire, fine, metaphorically. And the only way that we can get past this is to just walk through this fire. You know, I mean, they're terrifying. But we can't be terrified by them. We, or even if we are terrified, we just have to keep walking because, you know, Dershowitz is right, and unfortunately, he's becoming a lone voice also in the United States. You see aggravated assault against pro-life students on U.S. college campuses. I just read a Jonathan Turley article this morning. It said that a professor at Hunter College, I think, attacked her own students violently because they were pro-life. So now wrong think makes violence legitimate, which is exactly what we're seeing in Israel. We saw it on Tel Aviv University campus, on University of Haifa campus. We see it on the streets of Tel Aviv all the time. We see it in the kibbutzim. Anytime a government cabinet, you know, minister comes to visit, we're seeing it now in the United States, uh, again, deployed against Israeli lawmakers who are there. So, you know, we're seeing that they're enabling violence. This may very, very well become a murderous situation very soon because they've completely legitimized the idea of assault and battery against elected officials and their uh, supporters. Uh, so we're in a very, very dangerous situation. The police are clearly not acting. They won't uh, take action against these people. They won't arrest them. The prosecution, of course, won't indict them because the prosecution is with them. The judiciary is with them. So, you know, when you don't have a lot of choices, you just have to go with the only choice you have, which is to just plow forward and move on. It's a difficult time. There's a lot of other stuff going on in Israel this week, and I'm really happy that in the second broadcast of the week, the official Carolyn Glick show, I'm going to be talking about Iran, Saudi Arabia, and all of the rest of the strategic issues that we're contending with. But I wanted to take these few minutes with you now and just the just just between me and you guys talk to you about what's happening domestically it, it's very alarming and uh we just have to we just have to walk through it so that's it those are my thoughts have a great week mm -hmm.